Hi guys, Christian here again. Welcome back to the Royal Armouries channel. And today we've got another, what is this weapon for you? Uh, this one, there's a very good chance that you probably figured out what it was from the uh, Facebook post, but if not, here you go. Uh, by the way, if you aren't aware, this, uh, this is a tie in with our social media. So do feel free to head over to our Facebook page uh, to play along with this every week and uh, to have a guess at what we're going to show you. So what we have today here is the Pedersen, or specifically the Vickers Pedersen Model PA. Uh, this is a rifle that was produced in towards the end of the 1920s and into the 1930s, uh, and it was designed by John Pedersen. Uh, he was an American designer who designed a few rifles and other things. Uh, you may know him from the Pedersen device of the First World War, this uh, that funky US pistol caliber 30 uh, model of 1918 that went into a Springfield rifle and turned it into a self-loading pistol, uh, which we may cover one day here. Uh, but this is one of his uh, slightly later designs. It really started at, towards the end of the 1910s into the 1920s. And this was a big competitor uh, in the US Army rifle trials. Uh, it did eventually lose out to the Garand, uh, as we well know, uh, that was selected in the 1930s. Uh, but nonetheless, it certainly uh, gave a good go of the process. So here it is itself. And you can see it's quite a sleek thing. Uh, it's not particularly heavy either and uh, it's really quite nicely made. Uh, it was made by Vickers Armstrongs in Crayford here in the UK. Uh, that's who uh, John Pedersen contracted out or licensed out production uh, to uh, after the very initial design stages. And so it will say on the side here, if I can show you that to the close up, uh, it does say Vickers Pedersen uh, on here or Vickers Armstrongs. Aside from that, it's a self-loading rifle. Uh, this is very early at this time, and this is something that a lot of countries were looking at in the interwar period, and Britain is certainly no exception. So I said that America had already uh, looked at this and eventually rejected it. That's probably where uh, the Board of Ordnance here in the UK and the War Office actually got the first inklings of this rifle existing from, because um, it was making some, quite, some uh, quite big headlines over in the States. So this was eventually entered into a British Army trial, in fact, if you guys have seen, you know, if you've been with us for a while now, you might have seen our video before on the Bang Model B1 rifle. Uh, if you haven't already, do feel free to go check that out. Uh, this is actually related in that it's from the same process. So an order was placed for two of these rifles in 1929 at a cost of 250 pounds each. Now, if you remember back, back to the Bang, that was 50 pounds. So this is already costing five times as much. Um, hopefully at least this time around the gun actually works. Uh, two were purchased and they arrived in 1930 and they were uh, subjected to their acceptance trial and they both failed. So they were sent back to Vickers Armstrongs who then sent back serial numbers 24 and number 25. So I have here number 24 and here we have number 25. So this is the rifle layout. You'll see later, we've also got here a carbine version. That comes in later, we don't actually have any trials records of this one. Uh, but just to show you how the thing works, it's a little bit complicated. So I'll open up here, and you can see already, oh boy, there's a lot going on. Uh, in fact, this may look somewhat familiar to you. You might be thinking that this looks a little bit like a Luger. Um, loosely speaking, yes, but there is one major difference here. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. But you can see here, there's a toggle action here, kicking up, and you can see on the inside here, um, the bolt face there, which lets you uh, feed, your magazine, uh, feed your clip into the magazine here. This takes a 10 round clip uh, of 0.276 inch Pedersen, uh, which is quite difficult to find these days. I'm afraid I don't have an example to show you. But it's a, an intermediate caliber cartridge, we call it today, it's seven millimeters. Um, it's quite, um, it's, this is something that was being looked at uh, at the time. Uh, Britain was in fact looking at a 276 inch cartridge uh, before the First World War even. Uh, and of course would eventually try and do that with the 280 after the Second World War. So this is maybe why they're looking at this uh, because they might have been thinking 276, still not quite letting that go yet. Uh, one big problem, however, from this whole system is that that cartridge is quite particular. It needs to be lubricated to work in here. Uh, and I'll show you why. As I have here, a Luger to demonstrate. So with the Luger, it has a similar toggle lock system here. Uh, it looks a lot more simplified. 
and that's because this is shooting nine parabellum, but also because this is a short recoil system. So if I go back to the beginning, the barrel actually moves back just a little bit. When the barrel moves back, you can see these big round knobs here, which roll against this surface here, and that kicks the toggle up. So it's actually locked completely into the system until it moves back a bit. Here on the Pedersen, there is no movement of the barrel. You can see here, nothing's happening. So this is just straight up locked when the bolt is down like that. This means you need lubricated ammunition for it to work properly, otherwise the uh, cartridge case might get stuck inside the action. Uh, and then also another big thing about that, and the reason why this costs 250 pounds per rifle, is that you need quite complex uh, and very precise machining on the surfaces inside uh, this action here. And to demonstrate that, I think it's probably best if I take it out and show you. So I'm going to do that using the method given in the manual, which is not the most dignified, but we'll give it a go. You have to brace the butt on the inside of your right knee, stick the left hand of your action over the top here, and then as you're pulling this up, you need to push this little stub through. I'm going to try and do it on camera without getting it really wrong. There we go. So now we have retained the spring tension of our bolt in there and we can get back to business. So now we push forward a little bit, unhook the rear end, which is a little bit finicky sometimes. There we go. And we can send the bolt forward, bring this out back and up and out. Already you might be starting to see the problem. If I put her down now and we can see up here, there's a whole lot going on. So I can even take this top plate off, that just slides off uh, with our cocking handle on it. So you can see there our, our mainspring, uh, that is actually captive now, uh, hence why we're able to take the thing out of the gun. But you can see there's a whole lot going on here. Um, lots of very complicated uh, machining going on, lots of actions. This is all machine steel as well, uh, big, heavy, um, very precise. Uh, and that's just to make the gun safe, because otherwise if you get any of this wrong, it either won't cycle or it will cycle too violently and you hit problems. So you can see here why it would end up costing five times as much for this as something else. Adding to that, one of the, the, they actually itemized the list of the various trials that they put these guns through uh, in, the, in the 1930s. So this went against the bang, as we said before, and also the Czech ZH-29. Uh, the ZH-29 actually won. It came five points ahead of this. So it was a pretty close race, um, both well ahead of the bang. But one of the big stumbling blocks of this thing was that it was considered uh, really difficult to train new soldiers on the mechanism and how it worked. Uh, I'm sure you can see why in that. So ultimately it didn't go very far in British testing. Uh, the two that we bought were put here in this collection, uh, first at the pattern room and now they're here. And that's pretty much the end we saw of the matter. In fact, it's interesting to look back at that trial again, because of course nothing was actually selected from that. Uh, the end of the trial said, the report said that while some improvements have been made since the most recent trial before that, which was uh, 1927. At the end of the day, the, the number four rifle that they had basically selected at the same time as this trial was going on would do everything they needed them to. Uh, it was more accurate than everything that had been tested and certainly a lot less complicated and a lot cheaper. Uh, you, if you're looking to equip an infantry section of these at 250 pounds uh, a rifle, that's a lot of money. If you have, say, a number f uh, seven number fours and one Bren, it's a lot cheaper and also potentially a lot more effective. So you can see why they went for that. Now, of course, at this time, people like to design systems, not just a single rifle or a single weapon. Uh, and the carbine as an entity was still a thing. And so not to be outdone, there was also a carbine version of this. It's a little bit dinkier. It's not actually too much lighter. Mainly, it's just cut down four stock and a slightly shorter barrel. Uh, nonetheless, it is just as complicated. Uh, it still has the same exact action, as you can see here. So nothing really too special there. Uh, this one, actually, we don't quite know how it got to the pattern room. It was just found one day and brought to account. 
so this has nothing to do with the trials, but nonetheless, it's something interesting to show you. So at the end of the day, uh, at least in the British service, as I said, there was a few reasons why uh, this didn't go forwards. The number four did everything we needed it to. Um, Self-loading rifles as well, there was a little bit of, um, there was a bit of an askance look at them thinking they might cause uh, soldiers to sp start spending too much ammunition in battle. Uh, and ammunition, as we all know, is expensive. So a self-loader might also be a bit problematic there. Uh, whereas a bolt action rifle makes you think a bit more carefully about your shots before you take it. Uh, as I said, 250 pounds of rifle, very expensive. Uh, so all in all, you can see why Britain didn't want to go for it, especially in the 30s when, you know, early uh, before rearmament had even taken on uh, as well. Uh, but also, at the end of the day, these didn't really go anywhere anywhere else either, uh, which is quite unfortunate given that Pedersen is sort of, it, he is viewed as a, a, very, a very proficient and very, um, a very good firearms manufacturer or designer. Uh, it just didn't really work out for him. And of course, Britain would then not adopt a self-loading rifle for about 25 years uh, after the trials that this was involved in. And that, of course, was the SLR. Thanks for watching, guys. As ever, we really appreciate you coming along. Uh, do feel free to come visit us at any of our sites here in the UK. We have three, of course. We're here in Leeds at the Main Armouries Museum. We also have presence at the Tower of London and, of course, at Fort Nelson uh, down near Portsmouth. So do come check us out. We've got a lot of cool stuff all in our various galleries. Uh, at the end of the day, we are also a museum. We do rely quite a bit on donations. So if you do like what we do here and want to support us, do feel free to check the links in below and maybe leave a donation. Otherwise, you can also help just by clicking like and subscribe. And of course, you won't miss out on any of our great content like this. So do please do that as well. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>